Well, this has been an interesting week. Talk about giving the pastor fodder for his message. Um, I don't know how many of you left the planet yesterday, but um, <laughs> I didn't. So I see you didn't either. So um, a man named Harold Camping, if you don't know, uh, predicted that yesterday would be Judgment Day, and that supposedly the rapture would happen yesterday and things would come to an end. And, and uh, there were quite a number of people who were frightened by that and some who acted on that in different ways. But, but camping was wrong. And yet he did prove the Bible right in one way yesterday. Um, Jesus himself said, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And the book of Deuteronomy says, you may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet claims, proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. So what we have is an example of a false prophet being given lots of television time in the last week, and that's very unfortunate. In my mind, it's really unfortunate because some folks who still have some skepticism about Christianity might find that's reinforced a little bit more, and uh, I feel pretty sadly about that. Uh, Harold Camping needs to publicly repent of what he just did. He needs to say, I was wrong, my method was wrong, I should never have done it, I am absolutely sorry, and please forgive me. He needs to do that publicly. And if he doesn't, he for sure is a false prophet. And I want to just instruct you, just as your pastor, because I love you. Never follow that man. He did it in the 90s. He's done it in 2011, predicted this thing. He's totally wrong. He... Uh, he, he, he approaches the Bible with a method called numerology, where somehow you find your own secretive ways of finding a code about what the Bible says. And you know what the Bible says that we need to know is very plain and very clear. And so somebody that comes along and says, I'm really, I've got the secrets, and I can tell you when, when Jesus is going to come, is absolutely wrong. Don't ever believe that person. That is a false prophet. Why can't I say that so confidently? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, about that day or hour when he comes back, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Harold Camping just made himself equal to God the Father. You should never follow that man. And you should never follow anybody who approaches the Scriptures with kind of this superstitious numerology attempt at interpreting the scriptures. We need discernment in our day. I was absolutely floored by the amount of people that followed what he said. Don't do that. I'm just speaking because I love you. Don't do that. Be discerning about who you follow in your life. Well, the final question in our Doubt Your Doubt series is a challenging one. How could a loving God send people to hell? We've covered a lot of questions, and these are honest questions that people have. You can see a number of them there on the screen that we've covered. But the one today is, how could a loving God send people to hell? And by the way, all of these messages are online in different media formats in our website, shalombaptist.org. You just click on messages, and you'll get them there. So how could a loving God send people to hell? The question comes from the conflict that we feel between the love and the wrath of God. It's frightening to think of the wrath of God, isn't it? And to believe that somehow he could be loving at the same time and punish forever, that's very difficult for us to take in. It's even more difficult when we realize that Jesus, more than any other person in the Bible, spoke about hell. I'll give you a few examples. Matthew 5, 
Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Or Mark chapter 9. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Or Matthew 23, Jesus says to religious leaders that were misleading people, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? The word hell actually comes off of Jesus' lips in the Bible 11 times. And about uh, five times, he speaks of it as weeping and gnashing of teeth that goes on there. People are just crying and their, feet, their teeth are grinding because of the torment. And then he says it goes on forever. Matthew 25, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So here we have Jesus. And our, you know, the most frequent picture that you see of Jesus on the wall is you know, he's really loving. He's really gentle and tender. But all of a sudden, this runs against our, you know, this picture of Jesus. And, and we have this wonderful Savior speaking so often about hell. I want to ask you this morning, how have you processed the topic of hell? People do it in a lot of different ways. Some try to ignore it. Others want to take the Bible and reinterpret it. Um, some want to say, yeah, there's a hell, but it'll be shortened and everybody will get saved in the end. Some want to avoid the Bible and avoid God. Others uh, just say, well, you know what? Everybody gets there to heaven. And then others say, well, I'm not sure where I'm going to end up. And that's kind of, I'm not sure, but I'm for sure going to send my kids to Sunday school just to make sure they know, you know. The reason I ask uh, whether or not you're processing this and how you are is because it is an eternal question for you. Have you thought this through? Engaged couples often make the mistake of preparing a lot for the wedding day while not preparing very much for the marriage. And, and we can do that also. You know, many people live life this way. We have time for work and we have time for entertainment. But when do we have time? to talk about matters of eternity. We have time for sports, and we have time for gardening, but when do we have time for God? And it's important that we do. Jesus said in John 3, whoever believes in Him, that's Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus came into our world so that we would thoughtfully approach the eternal realities that are ahead of us, called heaven and hell. I just want to ask, have you done that? And today's an opportunity just to advance that dialogue and do that a little bit more. As with each of our messages in this series, we're going to look at a miracle story in the Gospel of John. Today, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 38 through 44. Now, the backstory is that Jesus' friends have told him a number of days earlier, your friend, Lazarus, is really sick. It looks like he's going to die. Can you please come and heal him? And so Jesus actually uh, takes that in and doesn't budge. He doesn't go to Lazarus. And... He actually doesn't come to Lazarus until four days after Lazarus is dead. And so we read the story in John eleven thirty-eight 38 through 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by, the time, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, 
that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now we remember our question today is this, how could a loving God send people to hell? And as we read through this story, we find several points of discernment about that question. The first one is this, we cannot separate the love of God from the justice of God. Our question seems to do just that. How can a loving God send people to hell? It's as though the, the two things can't go together at all. But what I want to show you today is that they can. And, and, and so we see the, the love of Christ, first of all, in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. So he's deeply moved. It's his friend who's dead, right? And, and he's moved, no doubt, because of all of his other friends around him who are crying and weeping. And he's deeply moved because of the reality that death is the consequence of sin that has separated humanity from God. He's deeply moved. There's another time in this text earlier. John eleven thirty three 33 says this. When Jesus saw her, one of Lazarus' sister, weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And there are other times, Luke 19, 41 and 42, Palm Sunday. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. He looks over Jerusalem. He realizes how blinded it is when the Son of God, the Savior, is right in their presence. They're not getting it. And he weeps. And... The cross demonstrates the love of God as well. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus is deeply moved. There's a, a love for people. There's a, it's this incredible, infinite, everlasting love that comes from the heart of the Son of God. But the cross not only demonstrates that love, it also demonstrates at the same time the justice of God, the wrath of God toward sin. Romans 3, 25 and 26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What we're saying here is that God was not only driven by love for us in sending His only Son, when Jesus died on that cross, both love and justice were demonstrated, and God's righteousness was defended so that He could actually justify you, He could forgive you, and give you the righteousness of God and make you absolutely ready for heaven because of what Jesus did as your and my substitute on the cross. Jesus took all of my punishment for my sins and yours as well. And God demonstrates that He is righteous and no sin will ever be left unpunished because of that righteousness. So the only way that God could express His love was to also express His justice at the same time. And, and the cross demonstrates that. So how can a loving God then be filled with justice or, or the outcome of justice, which is wrath? How can God, who is love, have also wrath in Him? Well, let's think about that for a moment from a human level. Every person that loves someone sometimes gets filled with anger or wrath because of things that hurt the person that you love. So if someone that you love is making self-destructive choices, that's going to stir you up with some anger, isn't it? If they're drinking or doing drugs or just making foolish choices, it stirs you up with a, a kind of a... You want your, your loved one to live well and be whole and, and happy. It stirs you up. Uh, Becky Pippert wrote it this way, kind of carrying that analogy a little bit further. Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is. 
And the final form of hate is indifference. God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but his settled opposition to the cancer, which is eating out the insides of the human race, he loves with his whole being. That's a really good description of love and wrath together. Love and justice cannot be separated. Jesus' love for us moved him to give his life for us on the cross so that justice could be satisfied for our sins. This also meant that Jesus loved his father and sought to defend his father's righteousness so that God could be both the just and the justifier of the one who puts faith in Christ. The two can't be separated. And so our question has begun in the wrong direction. More importantly, justice is something that we all want. Inside of each one of us as human beings, we know when somebody has wronged us and we want justice. We get angry, we, 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 we get bitter, we want to fight back, there's vengeance in our spirit. Sometimes we forgive at, the, at our own cost, but we want justice. It's in us. There was a lot of emotional release when the news came out that Bin Laden was killed a few weeks ago. Look at this New York newspaper front page. It says of Bin Laden, rot in hell. Rot in hell. Now, I don't agree with the sentiment there. And like one gal said to me after first service, anybody who <laughs> studies what hell is about would never wish that on anybody, in a sense. But on the other hand, 65%, according to a recent poll just in the last week or two, of Americans agree that bin Laden will be eternally punished for his sins in hell. You see, something, justice is something that, that we want, and there are actually moments when we think it's right that there's a hell. So we kind of play it both ways here in our, our culture. We say, hey... God should be, you know, just loving everybody. Everybody gets in. But then if Bin Laden comes along, we say, rotten hell. We want to talk both directions from it. We're, we're a little bit hypocritical. And we're not realizing that within us is imprinted the image of God, and there is a cry for justice. There are times when we realize how important justice is. Pastor Stephen Furtick tweeted on the day that we found out of this death of bin Laden, I do mourn death, the widespread death that bin Laden's life created. Today we must celebrate the sacrifice and victory of our troops. I unapologetically celebrate multitudes of people who will have an opportunity to live because of this man's death. That is good. That is victory. Or... This cry for justice from Miroslav Volf, a, Christ, a, a Croatian who, was, who saw the violence in the Balkans. He said, if God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a final end to violence, that God would not be worthy of worship. And he's coming at it from his own angle now. He says, my thesis is that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance will be unpopular in suburban homes of the West where the thesis of human nonviolence results from the belief, the belief in God's refusal to judge. In a sun-scorched land, soaked in the blood of the innocent, it, that belief that God is refusing to judge so we should be nonviolent too, that belief will invariably die with other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind, he says. So how could a loving God send people to hell? Well, the truth is, there are times when we would actually ask it the other way around, how could, the, how could God not send people to hell? There is a cry for justice. We understand justice. Intuitively, we know it's real, that we need justice in this world. We just don't connect all of that together in the same conversation sometimes. And even though our inner drive for justice can be twisted into evil, the insti instinct for justice is there because we're created in God's image. And so let's look at our second point of discernment about our question. How could a loving God send people to hell? Number two, God has made clear the way of salvation from hell. When we have in, what we have in this miracle story is truly 
one of Jesus' amazing miracles in the Scripture. And so he says, Lazarus come out, and Lazarus somehow waddles out. You know, he's all wrapped up in the grave clothes still. And he makes it out, and they unwrap him, and he's alive. It's a miracle. It's an amazing miracle. But what was the point of it? Remember, we've, we've gone each week and we've all realized that there's usually a point to the miracle story that is in the Bible here. And so uh, we realize now Lazarus still, you know, Lazarus is not alive today. <laughs> he, he must have died again. What was the point of it? So why did Jesus resurrect him? Well, he gives us a clue, verse 40. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And the answer is yes, he did. Uh, he said that back in John eleven four, 4, which said the same thing. Jesus says of Lazarus' illness, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. How then was Jesus glorified through Lazarus' death? Well, one clue to help us answer that question is found in verses 14 and 15, where Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So up to this point, no one gets what Jesus is up to. And, and we wouldn't either. I mean, let's be honest. We would not have a clue what he's up to. And we would be pretty conflicted on the inside. Why didn't he come? Why didn't he come? He could have rescued. He could have stopped him from dying. Why didn't he come? You know? So up to this point, nobody gets it. Verses 21 through 26. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die. They die. And whoever lives by, by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The real point of this miracle is to bring people then and people now to understand the glory of Jesus. That he is the resurrection and the life. He's the one who can take uh, death and just overcome it. He can conquer it. He can bring somebody dead four days back to life. He's the one who can overcome the, the, the consequences of sin and, and overcome hell. And he can save us from our sins. But there's more. Jesus plainly wants us to realize that not only is he the resurrection and the life, but that we then need to put our faith in him. And so he says, do you believe that? Which is really the main question of the whole series here. Doubt your doubts. Do you believe that? And we've asked honest questions and, and we've looked at them and we've given you reason to doubt your doubts and reason to believe but Jesus' question really comes down to the crux of the matter. Do you believe? Some do struggle with the concept of hell. I, this is the first full-length sermon I've done on hell for 24 years of pastoring. I mean, I talk about it, but I don't like to talk about it. It's terrifying. It's tragic. It's a struggle. And I understand that. That we do struggle. But the just truth of hell is accompanied by the free gift of salvation that Christ offers. We do not have to go there. But as someone said, there are some who say to God, thy will be done. And there are others who at the end of life, God says, thy will be done. And they end up in hell. And to describe really what goes on and give us some clarity about this question today, C.S. Lewis kind of describes about the kind of the progressive entrance that goes where we, we, we in this life choose hell and we end up there. And so this quote to describe that from C.S. Lewis, hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it, but there may come a day when you can no longer. Then, the, then there will be no you left to criticize it, criticize the mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. 
it is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. What Lewis is saying is that you have the opportunity to um, nip in the bud your sinful nature because God has given you the opportunity to come to Christ. And every day that you do not choose that, you are progressing into hell. And it's a fair warning, I think, that Lewis brings that we should realize that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of urgency. We don't know if by the end of today we have not turned to Christ, if our heart will be so hardened that it will be set in stone and we will never ever turn. Don't overestimate your ability. How could a loving God send people to hell? Well, we've seen this. First, we cannot separate the ideas of love and justice, so the question is not based in reality. In fact, we all long for justice, and many of us even want hell to be real when confronted with certain circumstances. Second, God has made clear the way of salvation for, and, 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 that, and that those who reside in hell have freely chosen that. So if you, see the, if you have seen the topic of hell as a, as a cause to doubt God, I hope today that perhaps you will come to the place where you doubt your doubts. And perhaps you even would come to the place today where you are ready to step into a relationship of personal faith in Jesus Christ. So I ask you today, have you thought this through? Now, I, I just really want to ask you, because I love you. Have you thought this through? Have you given eternity the time that it deserves? If you died today and God were to ask you, why would I allow you to have, into heaven? What would you say? Honestly, I've had a few people tell me when I've asked them that, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I know I've done some bad things, but I've done, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm a lot better than I am bad. And what the Scripture tells us is that nice people don't go to heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by your own works, not by your niceness, so that nobody can boast. Nobody going to get into heaven that's going to say, Lord, look at me. I was a nice person. I was a nice Minnesotan. Look at me. Not going to be one person like that. God doesn't allow nice people into heaven. In fact, uh, there are no nice people. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that means that even one act of disobedience would be enough for God to justly send us to eternity in hell why because he is that infinitely holy and perfect that we have viewed him as worthless in our sin this is, is an offense that drives that justice let me ex explain it this way um has anybody seen a mosquito this spring yet anybody has anybody killed a mosquito anybody raise your hand if you okay did you hear the police sirens when you did that did anybody come after you no. In fact, we have a program here to spray and kill as many of those little suckers as we can, right? Because they're not worth that much. Somebody abuses the dog or the cat, well, you might get slapped with a misdemeanor, right? If you hurt a human being or you kill a human being because of the comparative value of a human being, that will get you some jail and prison time. Ramp it way up to the level of God and say, if you sin against God, who is infinitely holy and absolutely perfect in righteousness, and you sin against God, what do you deserve then? What do I deserve? So, there are two ways your sin can be justly punished. First one is this. Stay in your own path 
without believing in Christ, and you will end up in eternal punishment in a place called hell. And through all of eternity, you will suffer for your sin. And it will take forever for you to come to a payment of that. Or you can look to Jesus, who on the cross took my place and yours, who suffered an enormous amount, an infinite outflow of the wrath of God for your sins and mine. And He took the punishment. And you can come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've sinned. I need to be forgiven. And I put my faith in You and know that You are the resurrection and the life. Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, God is not in the business of saving nice people. If you're a nice person, God's not going to save you until you get past the realization that, you know, I think I'm nice, to the point where you're saying, I am desperately needy as a sinner who has offended an all-holy, infinitely righteous God. And when we get to that point, all of a sudden we become desperate. We become people who call on the name of the Lord so that we might be saved. We become people who want to cry out and say, Jesus, forgive me, save me, help me, change me, make me a man of God. And those are the folks that Jesus rescues. Romans 4, 5. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, Their faith is credited as righteousness. God justifies ungodly people. Not nice people. Ungodly. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the man said at the temple steps. Remember that parable from Jesus? And he went home justified, Jesus said. Desperation, humility, hunger, righteousness, a love for God, a love for people, a faith that will not waver is the product of coming to a personal relationship with Christ. And we experience then the greatest miracle of all. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. The only way we're going to be saved from ourselves and from the wrath of God is if there's a miracle that happens of faith in Christ and salvation happening in our lives where we become transformed. Loving God and loving people. Desperate and hungry for righteousness. Desperate for forgiveness. Humbled before God. A man and a woman that is transformed by the grace of God at work in our lives. Doesn't that sound great? Isn't that just something? It sounds so hopeful. I can be changed. I don't have to go on in my stupidity and my self destruction. I don't have to do that stuff any longer. I could be different. God can move in and take over. Isn't that great? That's good news. That's what God is laying out before us in the person of Christ. And so here we are. End of the series. We talked a lot about doubts. Giving you a lot of good reasons. And we've kind of given you a lot of data. But there comes a time when it's time to respond and say, okay, I need to decide about this. And I, I think it's a good day to do that. Hear the Scripture. Today is the day of salvation. And in your heart, you may know that it's time for you as well to give your life to Christ. I just invite you to join with me in a little prayer here at the end. And if, if this is happening in your life for the first time authentically, or you're just saying to Christ, I want you for the first time, would you tell me? And would you tell two others? here today as well. We're going to just say a little prayer. And I'm just going to pray it as though 
it were you. And you can just pray it in your heart with me and uh, invite the team to come as well as we do that. So let's pray. Oh, Father God, I want to say thank you for loving me and for never giving up on me. I want to say thank you, Father God, for sending your Son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you for taking my place on the cross, for taking my punishment for all my sins. Lord Jesus, right now I just want to ask you for your forgiveness. Father God, would you forgive me? And will you put in me your Holy Spirit? It just moves me in my life to love you, Father, to live for your glory, to turn away from sin. And Lord, to be a light for you. Jesus, I give my life to you right now.